pressure. Amen. Because see now, it's, it's Jesus who's really carrying the load. He's the one that's carrying the load. Amen. It means to abide. It means to strengthen for bearing a heavy load. The load that's placed upon our shoulders sometime by worry and fear or by pain. And God says he has given us the provision to bear the load. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye who are heavy laden, all ye who are carrying a burden. He says, learn of me. He says, I'm going to take that yoke upon himself. He says, as we learn upon him, he says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Somebody's trying to come in, D. So how do we do it? It's very simple. I want you to go with me to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. We're going to have to learn how in this season to fix our eyes in one place. That means focus. We have to focus in one place. You say, how do we do that? You do it by fixing your eyes on Jesus. The scripture tells us looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Watch this now. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And now he knew he was going to the cross. There was pain in his soul, even leading up to the place of death. But he had to endure even the death of the cross because there was a higher mission. There was a higher mandate. So Jesus had to endure a time of suffering for something better. Hopefully that we got our minds on the better for this world is not our home. So he endured the cross, despising the shame and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we must with determined determination, keep our eyes on Jesus. Or we will become overwhelmed by the challenges of this hour. If you listen to the news, it's pulling you this way, it's pulling you this way, it's this bad report, it's that bad report, there's death, there's, there's disease, there's infection all over the place. But we got to put our eyes in one place. We got to keep looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Why? Faith is important because faith is the opposite of fear. Where there's faith, there can be no fear. Where there's fear, there can be no faith. So as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus, he is the one who is responsible for finishing or completing or causing our faith to become mature. And I love what the scripture says, that even when we're faithless, he remains faithful. So in other words, when we start doubting, Jesus is still the same. Mm. Thank God. So go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. I want to share this portion of scripture. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to 32. We know the story. It's a very familiar story. It says, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go before him unto the other side. While he sent the multitude away, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of a sea, tossed with the waves. For the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the water. Now, just think about this. Jesus tells them, in the calm of a day to go to the other side, get in a ship and go to the other side. So everything was normal for them. So was everything normal for you and I three, four weeks ago. Everything was normal. That's all we knew was normal. So now we find ourselves in what is called abnormal. So Jesus sends them to go to the ship and to cross the lake or the sea. And right there in the middle of crossing, they find themselves in a de demonic storm. So the Bible says, and for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, 
it is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, be of good cheer. I believe that's what the Lord is speaking to you and I right now. No matter how bad this looks, be of good cheer. He says, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter, I love Peter. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. See, now what we got to look for in the midst of this, 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 this demonic situation is a clear instruction from the Lord. He commanded Peter to come. Peter says, if it's you, bid or command me to come. And Jesus said, okay, Peter, come on. And Peter, and when Peter was come out of the ship, he walked on the water. Now, notice this. Peter didn't have the natural ability to walk on water. And nor do you and I. You and I don't have the natural ability to walk through the season. But when we follow the command of the Lord, when we act on the word that God gives us, we'll have supernatural enablement to do what we do not have a natural strength or ability to do. So when Peter act on that word, the supernatural kicked in. And I believe the supernatural is going to kick in when we hear God's voice and follow the instruction. Amen. Can you say amen? Amen. And so he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Somebody say, but. But, but here's what we got to be careful not to do. We got to be careful not to put our eyes on what's happening in the world. We got to be careful not to look away from Jesus and to begin to see how overwhelming everything else sounds and how everything else looks. Yes, death is taking place. People's lives are being torn apart. Uh, things are being disrupted. I mean, new normals are being established and there's fear and dread in the land. But we got to keep our eyes on Jesus because when Peter saw the wind, he became afraid. So we got to make sure that we keep looking to Jesus so that the fear and dread of what's coming into the land would not cause fear to grip our hearts. So Peter found himself sinking when it was that he was walking in a supernatural place that he didn't have natural ability to walk in. He cried saying, Lord, save me. And even if you and I begin to sink because of doubt, all we got to do is say, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said to him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Now the circumstances of this present hour of darkness will only have the ability to drown us in despair and hopelessness if we take our eyes off of Jesus. Our attention must be stayed upon Jesus. Our attention must be given to what Jesus speaks to us. We, when, when Jesus gives you and I a command, the word itself contains the power. Now, now this is what we got to stop struggling because the word has the power. It's not us who have the power. The word has the power. The word has inherent within us in it, a divine enablement to accomplish what we don't have strength to do. So we got to make sure that we hold on to the word of the Lord. No matter how sense rude our minds can become in this hour, we got to hold on to the word because the word has supernatural ability inherent within it. And so when Jesus gave, gives you and I a command, the word itself contains the power to take us to victory. But even if we start drowning because we take our eyes off of him, he, Jesus, will extend his hand to hold us up. Right. Amen. Amen. He declared he will uphold us with the right hand of his righteousness. He said no man is able to pluck us out of his hand. We got to hold on to that. The Lord said, tell my people. I have a tight grip on them in this hour. He said, I am able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless unto my coming. So God says, I have a tight grip on you. We got to get this in our heart. God's grip. Amen. It's, it's tight on us. He says, I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to let you despair. This may seem like the worst storm that you and I have ever faced. But here's what's true. The Lord of glory is in the storm with us. 
He is the creator of all things. All created things are subject to his command. Amen. Amen. All created things. We got to get that in our spirit. All created things are subject to his command. Go to Mark chapter four. Are you still here? Wave at me in the chat room or something. Amen. Bless the Lord. Look at Mark chapter four. Mark chapter four. Verse 36 to 39. Here again, Jesus is in the boat with the disciples and they encounter a storm. But he's in the boat sleeping. And it may seem like God is nowhere to be found in this present hour. Maybe you can't hear his voice, you think. Maybe you can't feel his presence, you think. But I want you to know that God is in this situation with you and I. Look at Mark chapter four, verse 36 to 39, uh, starting at verse 36. It says, and when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. Amen. Listen, Jesus is in this with us. Come on, say this with me. Jesus is in this with us. And there was also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship. So that it was now full and he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. So I want you to see what God's posture is in this season. He's not schizophrenic. He's not frazzled. He's not taken by surprise. He's resting. So if God is resting, you and I have to rest. Come on, say amen. 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 And they awake him and they said to him, Master, carest thou? Not that we perish. And he arose and rebuked the wind. Notice he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Now a demonic storm has arose in our lives. Like the demonic storm of their time. They were being overwhelmed by the sight and the size of the storm. And you and I can be uh, uh, at present being overwhelmed by the sight of this storm that we found ourselves in. But here's what we got to take courage in. Jesus is in the boat with us. Right. It's time to wake the Lord up. And, 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 and I want you to understand, you, you know how we're waking the Lord up? We're praying. We're praying like never before. He's hearing our voice like never before. So Jesus was in the hinder part of the boat, uh, boat asleep and he was the Prince of Peace. Will we be awakened to the reality in this hour that the author of peace will arise within us and command the storm within us to cease? Now, the storm can be raging in the world, but what has to happen is we can't allow the storm to rage within us. It does not matter what happens in the world. The Lord has commanded peace to his people. And I want to encourage you to be at peace. Go to Psalm 29, 11. Psalm 29, 11. Look at the encouragement of the Lord. The Lord will give strength unto his people. Notice that. The Lord will give Peace unto his people. He didn't say he would give peace to the world. He said he would give peace unto his people. My question is, are we truly his? Because if we are, the Bible says he gives peace to us. The Lord will bless his people with peace. So in other words, God says, I've already blessed you with peace. Because God does not give peace independently of himself. He gives himself. And when he gives himself to us, the peace of God is in our lives. Look at Colossians. We are told to let the peace of God rule in our hearts. Colossians chapter 315. This is what the scripture says. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts 
to the which also ye are called in one body. So in other words, we've been called to peace. In other words, in other words peace is our inheritance. We've been called to peace. And the Bible says, let it rule. And then it says, you are called in one body and be ye thankful. So in other words, find the strength to live in thanksgiving, no matter what's happening. Find the courage to remain thankful. Now, this word rule refers to the activities of the umpire whose office at the games is to direct, arbitrate, and decide the context. In other words, peace will decide what's going on in your life. You and I can either decide to be anxious, fearful, fretful, doubtful, or worried, or we can allow God's peace to begin to call the shots. In other words, the umpire would, would call the balls and strikes. And so right now, peace is calling the balls and strikes and you're not going to be called out. Amen. Bless the Lord. We're not going to be called out in this hour because peace is calling the shots. Peace is controlling our lives. In the wider sense, it then came to mean to order or to rule or to control. Daphne, peace is going to control you. Yes. You're going to sleep every night. Yes. Without any disturbance. Yes. Amen. I prophesy to every last one of you. You're going to sleep at night without any disturbance. You're not going to go to bed fretting. You're not going to get up fretting. Peace. Yes. Jesus says, have I given unto you my peace? Not as the world give I unto thee. I want you to go to first uh, second Thessalonians chapter 13. I want to encourage you. Second Thessalonians chapter 13, verse 13, Amplified Bible. Paul says this, he says, as he says, and as for the rest of you, believers, do not grow tired or lose heart in doing good, but continue doing what is right Without weakening. In other words, God says you're going to have the ability to, to endure. Keep on doing what God has revealed to you and I to do. Regardless of what's going on. God empowers you and I by his spirit. So in other words, don't grow weary in well-doing. For in due season, you're going to reap if you faint not. We will not become faint. The Bible says that men are always to pray and not to faint. And I believe that as we continue to pray, as we continue to persevere, we're going to have the supernatural ability to endure without weakening. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7. Amplified Bible. We have to understand the all-powerful love of God. Amen. God's love. See, see, everything hinges, hinges on your and my revelation of the love of God. In this hour, everything hinges on that, that you are loved by God, that he never abandons you, that he never leaves you, that he never forsakes you, that God's love is so real, it's so entrenched in our heart, because by that will have the ability to endure. The Bible says that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. See, see, why would God subject his people to, to going through hardship if he, if he truly loves them? But listen, God loves us whether we go through hardship or good times. It doesn't change. And that's why we got to understand how powerful God's love is. Why? Because love gives you the ability to bear up under all things. Look at what it says here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7, love bears all things, regardless of what comes, believes all things, looking for the best in each other, hopes all things, remaining steadfast during difficult times. You see what's going to get you through the, come on now, listen, the first thing we lose in difficult times is our patience. And most of all, we're people and most of all, the ones who are closest to us. Now, we're shacked up with some people that we've been shacked, haven't been shacked up with some, for a long time. Amen. Amen. Husbands haven't been, been at home with wives. Uh, parents haven't been at home with children to the extent that they are. So what do we need? We need the love of God to constrain us. 
We need to be able to bear up under things. And so it says, remaining steadfast during difficult times. Love endures all things without weakening. Without weakening. And so how are we going to get through these times? We're going to get through it by understanding the love of God. The love of God. The love of God. He loves me. Not only does God love me, but I have the capacity to love people. Amen. Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy chapter two, verse three to 10. Paul tells Timothy this. He says, thou therefore endure hardness. In other words, endure hardship. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that wareth entangleth again, entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, worldliness, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a good soldier. So in other words, Paul saying, be disciplined, be disciplined, be disciplined. In other words, the way that we're going to be able to endure the hardness of this hour is to live disciplined lives. Be people of, 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 of the presence of God. Be people of worship. Be people of the word. Be people of the love of God. In other words, we'll have the discipline to endure what is being released in the earth. And so he says, and if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give, give thee understanding of all things. Remember, remember this, remember that Jesus of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. This is what Paul says, wherein I suffer trouble. Paul says, listen, Jesus, the one who died, he, was, he, was, he rose again from among the dead according to the gospel that Paul was preaching. And he says, I'm suffering for the sake of that gospel. That's why you and I suffer. He says, I'm suffering for the sake of that gospel. He says, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. I love this. But no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're experiencing, we need to hang our faith on this next statement that Paul says. He says, but the word of God is not bound. I don't care what it looks like, saints of God, the word of God is not bound. That's, that, that means that the word is alive, it's sharp, it's powerful, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. The word of God is spirit and life. The word of God will produce what God says it will produce in our life. If we hold on to anything, it's got to be us holding on to the word. The word is not bound. We may seem like we're in prison, but the word is not in prison. One translation said that the word cannot be chained or in prison. So in other words, keep Focusing on the word. He says, therefore, I endure. How do we endure? We endure because the word can't be chained. We endure because the word can't be in prison. We endure because God says all of the promises in him are yes and amen. So be it. The word settles it. The Bible says that his word is settled in heaven. So in other, in other words, so whatever is settled in heaven is so in your life and my life. We got to hold on to the word. He says, therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So two things I want you to remember here. Number one, we must endure hardness. This word hardness is from the same word, which means uh, to undergo hardship or affliction. It means to endure afflictions. It means to endure hardness. It means to suffer trouble. But I love what the scripture says in Psalm 34. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord deliver us out of them all. There's a purpose for which uh, things are, uh, uh, the, 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 the way they are transpiring. God has a greater purpose for them. And it's not for, not for, for evil, but it's for good for us. Number two, we must remember that though we are experiencing hardship, that we have not known and seen the word cannot be in prison. Circumstances cannot imprison the word. The word cannot be confined to our circumstances. 
The word of God is the source of our victory. The word of God is the source of our freedom. The word of God is the source of our protection. The word of God is the source of our wisdom and our comfort. Paul told Timothy, the word of God cannot be bound. And so we must hold on to this reality. We may seem to be in prison for a season, but we got to hold on to the authority of God's word. It cannot be put in prison. Yes. Yes. We must take courage from the word and the testimony of those who suffered greatly in the scripture. This was the apostle Paul's testimony. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 to 9, NLT. I, I love the fact that when I look in the scripture, I see real people just like you and I who went through things and how uh, they held on to the word and how they held on to the living word, the resurrected one, and that he himself empowered them. Uh, he, did, he did not uh, 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 relieve them, so to speak, from trouble, but he was with them in trouble. They had great victory holding on to Jesus. But Paul's testimony is this here in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9, 8 to 9, NLT. He says, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. I decree in the name of Jesus that there'll be no despair in your home. There'll be no despair in your mind. There'll be no despair amongst your children. I decree in the name of Jesus. He says, we are hunted down. But we are never abandoned by God. We are knocked down, but we are not destroyed. We can take hope and encouragement from those words. Paul, the apostle Paul, you know, shipwrecked twice. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, shipwrecked and, and, and beaten. I mean, and whipped three times. The Bible says uh, without uh, the 40th stripe, we must be sure not to cast away our confidence. If there's something that we need to hold on to today, we must be sure not to cast away our confidence in the Lord as this world is shaking all around us. Everything that can be shaken is shaken. Governments are shaken. I mean, world leaders don't know what to do. Everything is shaken. God is dealing with the foundations of what people believe in. Yes. We must be sure not to cast away our confidence. This is the hour where everything that can be shaken is shaken. Go to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm almost done. In a little while. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 27 says this. And this word yet once more signifies the removing of those things that are shaken. That's what God's doing. He's removing the foundations of what men trusted in. As of those things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Well, in order to have a foundation or something that cannot be shaken, your life has to be built on the right foundation. Amen. Because as true as, as, as that is a statement, people are beginning to shake by what they see happening in the world. Luke chapter 21, verse 26 says, men's hearts failing them for fear. So fear has a crippling, fear has a tormenting, fear has the ability to, to, to put people in bondage. Fear itself is the enemy. Men's hearts failing them for fear and looking after those things or paying more attention to those things that are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. God definitively said this through his son. He said the powers of heaven will shake. Amen. But there's hope for us. There's hope for us. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I don't know who that is, but their, their mic is on. Hebrews chapter 10. If your mic is on, please turn it off. Can you still hear me? Just wave at me if you can hear me. All right. Bless the Lord. We got it. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 to 36 amplified. Notice what the apostle Paul says. Do not, therefore, fling away your fearless confidence, 
for it has a glorious great reward. For you have need of patience. Here's that word patience. We started off with this. Sister Sheree talked about it. Endurance. What God is building in his people up to this point and beyond is the ability to endure everything that you've gone through, everything that God has done to refine you and I, everything that he's done to prove you and I, everything that, that, that he has allowed to happen that we would test and prove him has built endurance in us. He says, for you have a need of patience, endurance. To bear up under difficult circumstances without compromising. That's the key thing because there's going to be a lot of people who are going to compromise under the intense weight of what's being released in the earth. So that when you have carried out the will of God, you may receive and enjoy to the full what he has promised. Mm. So I've, I've made up my mind. I'm not going to compromise. I don't care how it looks. I'm going to trust God. I'm not going to look, you know, to try to do something outside of the parameters of God's word. God's word is what's kept me for these 34 years. And that's what's been keeping you. And I thank God that he has built himself in you to the point that you can trust him now, no matter what. Amen. Amen. So we must be persuaded. We must be persuaded. That the Lord is able to keep all we commit to him. And I pray right now that if there's things in our life that we have tr not truly committed to him. Family members, concern for extended members. I mean, uh, unsaved loved ones, wherever they might be. I mean, why don't you just lift your hands right, me, right, right now with me. And I want you to take those things and those people and those concerns. And, and I want you to give those things symbolically to the Lord. And say to the Lord, I'm committing all that concerns me to you. You can keep that which I committed to. Commit unto you. Father, I relinquish the care of my life, my family, Lord, my well-being, my, sus my sustenance, job, whatever it is. Father, we give it all to you right now. We relinquish the care and the concern of that. You are a shepherd and we shall not want. You will take care. Father, you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that's at work. We will not fret. We will not be anxious for anything. Lord, you said, Lord, to, to to cast all of our cares upon you for you care for us Lord you said be anxious for nothing but in all things through prayer Lord come on shall with definite petitions uh, with thanksgiving Lord you said Lord the peace of God would, 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 would rule over our hearts and minds through the Lord Jesus Christ so Father we cast it all on you right now in the name of Jesus and we thank you Father we're not going to take it back in Jesus name in Jesus name and gee, I am not going to take it back. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. We give yes. you praise, Father. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Second Timothy chapter one, verse 12. Go there real quick. Second Timothy chapter 12. Second Timothy chapter one, verse 12. Give God your soul. Give him the safekeeping of your soul. Look at what it says. Here. For this, for, for the which cause, this is what Paul says, I also suffered these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have Believe and and that that that's what you and I have to hold on hold on to. We know whom we have believed, and Paul says, "I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day." So this is the hour where we just give everything to God. We give Him everything. We carry nothing. Let the Word of God dwell in you richly. Let God's Word dwell in you richly. May the word of God become our meditation and salvation in this hour. That's how we're going to get through it. May the word of God become our meditation and salvation. Colossians chapter 3 verse 16 says this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, yes. teaching and admonishing one another. Notice it doesn't stop with you. It says teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in our hearts 
to the Lord. So in other words, God says, you be encouraged and you encourage others. You be encouraged and you encourage. That's how we're going to get through this. Amen. All of us are intricately, intricately connected to one another. So our victory and success is contingent upon what's happening in one another. So we're going to encourage ourselves, but we're going to encourage one another. Go to Psalm 28. Yes, Lord. Psalms 28. Verse 7 and 8 says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusteth in him. I love this. And I am helped. There's a song we used to sing at uh, HT. The Lord is my strength and my shield. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusteth in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices. My heart greatly rejoices. And with my song, I'm going to praise his name. See, we got to declare that the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusteth in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices, And with my song, I will praise his name. The Lord is is their strength and he is the saving strength of his anointed. That's personal. He is our strength and he is the saving strength of his anointed. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 12, verse two. A lot of scripture. I want, I want to compound you with scripture today. Isaiah chapter 12, verse two. This is how we're going to get through this season with the word. Isaiah 12, 2, behold, God is my salvation. It's got to be personal. I will trust and not be afraid. God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. It's personal. Amen. It's personal. All right. So. We got to make sure that our lives are built on the right foundation. Foundations matter in this hour. Go with me to 1 Corinthians. I am truly almost done. And then we're going to pray. Again, we got to make sure our lives are built on the right foundation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 through 11, NLT. Because of God's grace to me, this is what Paul says, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. No other building, he says, and others are building on that foundation. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, which is Jesus Christ. Yes. And we got to check and see if our lives are on the right foundation. Things are shaking all over. We're living in, a, in an uncertain time. And we got to make sure that our lives are secure on the right foundation. And that foundation, Paul says, is Jesus Christ. Mm. Luke chapter 6. Because if you're not on the right foundation... The winds, the torrents of the things that are happening in this life are going to test every foundation. Luke 6, verse 46 to 49. Look at what Luke says here. He says, so why do you keep calling me Lord? Or why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, like you know me? That's what that sounds like. Why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, like you really know me? When you don't do what I say, I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teachings and then follows it. It is like a person building a house. This house represents a life who digs deep and lays the foundation on a solid rock. The solid rock represents the foundation that the only foundation that can be laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is the rock. He is the foundation. If a man builds upon that foundation, he shall be secure. And when the floods rise and break against that house, that life, it stands firm because it is well built. 
But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground without a foundation. We, 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 we know what it's like. We've seen houses that are, are poorly built. We, we've seen what happens when, when hurricanes and tornadoes come. We, we, we've seen it on the news. We've seen the total devastation of, 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 of islands, you know, the Bahamas. We, we've seen, you know, uh, some of the islands out in the sea uh, over the course of the last year or two years. And we saw what happened to those faulty foundations. They were totally destroyed. And, and that's what life is when it's not built on the right foundation. And here today we're talking about the right foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Mm. And so he says, that person who hears and does not obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. And I want to let you know today, it's God's will that not one person perish. That's the very reason why Jesus came. That's the very reason why he hung on the cross. That's the very reason why he, he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He deprived Satan's of power over humanity by defeating him as a man, but raising triumphant as king of glory. So what do you and I need? What do you and I need? If we're going to endure the hard times, if we're going to know how to live in a rapidly changing world, we need an anchor for our soul. I want you to go to Hebrews. This is my last scripture. Hebrews chapter 6. Verse 17 and 20. And then we're going to pray. Verse 17 says, God also bound himself with an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. I thank God that God does not change his mind. Ooh. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. The Bible says, let God be true, but let every man be a liar. Man may lie, but God will always tell you the truth. Therefore, we who have fled, here it is, fled to him. For refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. The hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. What hope? This hope comes from Jesus Christ. The only hope for humanity is Jesus Christ. It leads us through the curtains into God's inner sanctuary. Jesus has already gone in there for us. He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So why an anchor for our souls? In the context of understanding this word, it deals with what an anchor uh, was supposed to do. And, and uh, in Roman times, like modern times, an anchor had two teeth. And flukes in Hebrews chapter six, verse 19, the word is used metaphorically for that which supports or keeps one steadfast in a time of trial or doubt. Again, that which supports, we need a support that which keeps us steadfast in the time of trial or doubt. It is an emblem of hope. Jesus is the only Emblem of hope for humanity. He is a living hope and he becomes the anchor of the soul. The, the soul. A soul without Christ is unstable. A soul without Christ is lost. He so loved the world, God says, that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth on him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So on this Resurrection Sunday, if you want to make it through these uncertain times, you need a living hope. You need Jesus. I want to invite you right there in your homes, all of you, saved and unsaved alike. I want you to bow your heads and we're going to go before the throne of God and we're going to pray.